He is credited with ending Rwanda's genocide, healing the country and producing an economic miracle. But his re-election in 2017 was not without critics. After more than two decades in power, is President Paul Kagame's political longevity his worst enemy? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. Rwanda has witnessed an extraordinary revival after it was torn apart in 1994 by a genocide that lasted 100 days and led to the killing of about a million people. Paul Kagame, the young and charismatic commander of the Rwandan Patriotic Front that put an end to the genocide, became vice president of the country in 1994 and president in 2000. He is widely credited for Rwanda's resurrection from its gruesome past. He has spearheaded a remarkable rebuilding effort. Infant mortality and poverty levels have dropped and literacy rates have risen. Now, one of the fastest growing African economies, Rwanda is expected to grow by 8.5% this year. But President Kagame has also faced criticism for one-party rule and has been accused of authoritarianism. After 17 years as head of state, Kagame was declared winner of the 2017 election with more than 98% of the vote. The election came after a constitutional amendment approved by 98% of voters ended a two-term presidential limit. Coming up, I speak with President Paul Kagame, but first, a look back at his rise to power. It's always difficult to accuse me of anything and then say, prove yourself innocent. I think I want to turn it to you and say, prove me guilty. It's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, with nearly a quarter of a century since his rise to power and almost two decades of rule, what will the future hold for Rwanda and its president? I recently sat down with Paul Kagame at the Doha Forum in Qatar. President Kagame, how do you feel? Aren't you tired after 19 years at the helm of your country? Fortunately, I feel I have a lot of energy left to, to keep going. I can go on for several more years and uh, I'm not tired of doing what I'm doing. I'm happy working with my people, for my people and my country, and uh, moving from the past of uh, tremendous challenges, but also making good progress and uh, creating hope for the people of Rwanda. You say you could keep going for several more years. What does that mean, though? Well, actually, on my mind, I was talking about uh, the 
number of years left in this term, in this term. that I'm serving. But then let me ask you this, because yes, you are a charismatic, popular leader who, as I say, many people regard as having done quite important work in your country, socioeconomically. I believe the economic growth per year is something to the tune of 7 eight percent. Some would consider this mission accomplished. Is it for you? No, it's never mission accomplished as far as we are concerned. It's a work in progress. Uh, are dealing with one challenge and uh, after that having to deal with another or dealing with many challenges simultaneously. Uh, so it's, it's never that people feel satisfied that they have uh, reached the point where they want to be. In, in fact, Africa, Rwanda being a uh, microcosm of everything African, we, we find there is a lot to do, there is a lot that has been achieved, but we have to keep uh, working, working hard, and because we understand what the problem is uh, that is uh, in my country or anywhere else that uh, affects us. But what is the main problem? Is it that there's still much work to be done to really heal the social fabric? I mean, I know your official mantra is we are all Rwandans now. You've gone as far as to ban any mention, any discussion, public discussion in Rwanda about ethnic diversity. So it is seen as criminally divisionist to use labels like Hutu and Tutsi. I mean, could this backfire? Does this actually help? Look, we have uh, a number of problems uh, all put together. They create a, a huge problem to deal with. One is history. My country has a problem of history, a problem of geography, a problem of politics. We have to deal with all that. Now, history and politics, in my case, has come together. These have, two have come together. Yes, we had the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, we lost a million people. Uh, the Rwandans killing other Rwandans. And of course, there was uh, there were many foreign uh, actors and factors involved, but uh, I, I don't spend much time on that. I just talk about uh, what our responsibilities, because in the end, when we come to rebuilding our country, we don't blame others. We just look up to ourselves to be able to pick the pieces and move forward. So it was politics of division that made some people in my country, look at themselves different, being different from the others. And it did not stop there. Uh, in fact, because of that difference, one section of the population descended on the other and killed uh, uh, the other section. So this issue of division or divisive politics is such that there has to be certain set of rules to be followed by everyone. Otherwise, anarchy isn't going to be the answer to this uh, complex problem. So that's why we therefore set the rules. Be able to express yourself and be happy with your identity, but don't use your identity for the detriment of the other that is different from you. So that's how that question you raised uh, comes about. But, but so let me ask you this. In terms of what's going on around the world, maybe we see it less so, at least less explicitly, uh, on the, the streets of African uh, capitals. But there is a demand for more accountability for new forms of leaderships and, and leaders. And Africa, as a continent, more than many other continents in the world, seems to have the most long serving rulers. I mean, I just think about Angola or about the case of Zimbabwe. You had heads of states who spent 37 and 38 years in power, Sudan, a good three decades. Uh, what do you say to those who believe that there should not be the sort of leadership for life? Well, you don't just talk about leadership or leaders being there for this number of years without putting that into context. Therefore, in, in some cases like you have mentioned, you may find it's not justified or it was justified up to a point. Then change that would have been necessary 
uh, should have happened. But this change, therefore, should be dependent on the context, but it should also be a result of the people of any country, what they have decided. So the, it's but, but don't not people want democracy? I mean, does that mean that you actually agree with what uh, the president of Zimbabwe, uh, the late uh, Mugabe, once said? He said that the idea of pushing term limits is a Western concept that is placed as a yoke on the neck of African leaders. You agree with that? Yes and no, because it does not mean one thing everywhere or every time. Because this is why I'm saying time is not an end in itself. When you say a leader has served for this long, that should not explain everything. But it is part of what you may explain dependent on the context and the choice of the people of any country. So now, when you talk about, uh, let's say, when you talk about the Western values or prescriptions which they have uh, uh, been throwing around to, to other people, sometimes they don't apply in their own places. So this is what I'm saying. It's not just one thing that is put there and it explains everything. But you don't have leaders who spent three decades in power and you don't have elections that result in 98 or 90% 90 yes, of the vote, which you, you had, know President Kagame. You know the I mean, reason? You were elected for a third term in 2017. The reason like is this that overwhelming majority the reason of the is, the not, is that we are not the West. So what does it tell you about the kind of system that's, that is in place? Uh, you, you see, this is what I'm saying. If you want to measure everything against the Western value system, that's what you are suggesting. And I'm, I'm suggesting that the, the Western system doesn't provide every solution to everything. Other people, other places, other countries have their value systems as well, and they are answerable to their own people. So it, it doesn't matter that, uh, and I'm saying, I'm not trying to explain away some of the wrongs some leaders or whatever you call them, Africans, have done. No, I'm not trying to explain that. But I'm saying, don't pick one thing and think that it answers or it speaks to every problem about the Africans. Well, in I'm fact, looking. some people may spend a longer time in one place and it is just fired. Others may spend the same time, and it is not justified. So that's why I'm talking about the context. That's what I'm, why I'm talking about, is it really the choice of the people of this country? Sometimes leaders make it look like it is the choice of the people of the country when it is not. All right. But where it is, then it should be respected. Well, you're saying that democracy then is not one size fits all, and it's, it's relative, not. but I do want to move to Absolutely this. not, because I, I think even the West that uh, you, you referred to, recently we have seen that it doesn't mean that. Absolutely. Some of the things they have been preaching, one, and I said, which they, sometimes they don't practice, in other times, when it has happened, we, we, we've seen how it is backfiring on some of the... You have specific examples. Well, Too long to list. <laughs> I can say it generally. One, in some places, they have chosen leaders, and then they start complaining about those leaders. So why would you complain about your leader that has come about because of your system of democracy? Sure. That means you have a problem with your own system. Well, they, they get voted out, though, don't they? Um, but President Kagame, you've criticized uh, fellow African leaders for seeking uh, photo opportunities uh, in Western uh, capitals and recognition in general by the West. But you yourself are quite often seen as uh, the darling of the West, if I can use that term. How, how do you view this? Well, I haven't been seeking to be anybody's darling. If anybody wants to make me their darling, that's their business. All right. <laughs> but I seek, I've been seeking partnership. I want to work with the people, whether they are Africans or outside of Africa. I'm very much for cooperation. What I don't like is dictates that come from some parts of the world to Africa or to Rwanda. That one, you, you will have a problem with me, no doubt about it. 
Okay, well, you talk about uh, seeking partnerships, and Rwanda is certainly seeking partnerships and is uh, quite open for business with Western corporations, Israeli corporations, all sorts of corporations that are, in fact, exploiting some of the country's natural resources. And I'm thinking more specifically about the rare earth metal, coltan, that Rwanda has about 50% of the world's production. And this is a, a metal that, without, we wouldn't be able to see as many uh, uh, cell phones and computers being produced. Do you think you might actually turn into not so much of a darling of the West if you actually decided to limit your production or closed off the access to some of these companies one day? I wish I, 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 wish I had more than just quarter, many other things. I wouldn't use them to pressure people into doing certain things, certain ways for me or for others. I would still be looking to achieve a fair and justified uh, cooperation where everyone gains. So that's what I would do. But we have it. We are happy to be having it. But we have a few other things. What we want to do is in fact to reach a level where we can add value to some of these things. Instead of uh, exporting minerals in their raw form, we want and have started investing in processing, in a refinery uh, of our minerals so that we, we, we get more value for, for what we, we have. So President Kagame, let me ask you then about uh, this issue of the minerals, the exploitation of the minerals, and how it has contributed negatively on the continent in keeping some of the crises that we've seen, whether it's in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or whether it's with the situation that involves your country, Rwanda, and uh, Uganda, and I know there's been a round of talks just recently that it's stalled, in fact, in the last few hours. Give us a sense of whether or not you could see uh, another conflagration with a country that you were very close to. You were very close with President Museveni a few years ago. And what, how do you see the situation in DRC and the prospects for peace well, and stabilization? Of all, with the DRC, I think there is great progress with the new leadership. Uh, the leadership seems to be more open to cooperation with the, uh, within the region, working with the neighbors and beyond. There has been very good progress on that, better than it was before the new president came in. So this is very helpful, uh, but that doesn't mean we have sort of developed a problem about that. But we use that cooperation to deal with the problems that we have to deal with. Yes, uh, we, you know, between Rwanda and Uganda, it's like a, a, a quarrel in the family. Uh, sometimes even quarrels that are not justified or reasonable. So we, we, we find ourselves in, in, in some of these. And, and personally, I, I really feel embarrassed sometimes because you cannot touch exactly why there would be this kind of misunderstanding because we are not quarreling over territory or border, you know, having gone you know, in anybody's definition the wrong way or, or things like that. But do but, you see another war breaking out between the two? No, 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 no. I, I don't think. At least we are still. Uh, more reasonable than to be able to do that. So we, we, we talk things out. There have been discussions going on. I think any problem can be discussed and, and resolved, and that's where we are headed, in my view. And so I want to just move on to another natural topic, I think, when we talk about these crises and what the root cause of some of these crises uh, is, uh, the rare metals and their exploitation. I want to talk about corruption, a phenomenon that is pervasive throughout the world, yes, but that seems to be more so in Africa. The African Union Commission, in fact, estimated that on average, every year, the illicit financial flows out of Africa add up to about $50 billion, and that's a conservative estimate. You yourself have been fighting corruption. You say it's feasible. You have said this is a campaign that can be won, that tolerating corruption is a choice, it is not inevitable, and it is within our power to do so. But can you really root out corruption at the systemic 
level? It's possible. For example, we have started with uh, our own country. We have tried to put uh, systems in place, institutions, but also carried out education throughout different levels of our society to understand the implications of allowing corruption to be rooted in our society. And we have encouraged openness uh, to talk about it. We have had whistleblowers, but so in other words, introduce a couple of things, uh, transparency, accountability, uh, and we have seen levels really come down of corruption in my own country. And this is what we discuss with the neighbors and others uh, on our continent. We can deal with this problem. And already we know the dangers involved. We've seen that it is, so it's a mindset problem. If people don't want corruption and want to fight it, corruption will be reduced to the most minimum. So you don't believe that it is also a, a cultural issue that has permeated some of the more uh, local aspects of everyday life. And I know, just to put it in it's context, enough. you say you've done quite a bit, and Transparency International actually ranks Rwanda the fourth least corrupt African country. And you yourself have taken measures to reduce corruption by putting, for example, government services online as a way to reduce the bribes that are given and taken. But do you think this will actually, you know, root out corruption? How long would it take? It will root out corruption, not only in Rwanda, even with others who want to root out corruption in their places or continent-wide. And, and this is why I'm saying it's, not, it's nothing like, uh, it is not cultural, it's not anything. It, it, it's only that it has gone on for too long and the people have sort of made it a way of life uh, without consequences, or, or at least they don't see the consequences, otherwise the consequences are always there. So, uh, and by the way, the, the 50 billion dollars that uh, leave our continent and go somewhere else, you understand it's not just the Africans involved. It's also those people where the money actually goes. So corruption is not African at all. It's a global problem, as you rightly say. And, and but there has been more of it practiced. And, and, and many, because of different factors, including uh, lack of uh, governance, proper governance structures in place, uh, even under development itself has uh, uh, contributed to that because people are given so little and end up leaving, uh, losing so much because of that. So you're saying a certain a level of complicity, yes. uh, if I read you correctly, within the Western capitals, I imagine. But uh, does this... Even without Africa and the without... Western capitals, I think within the capitals of the West, there is corruption. Okay. So let me ask you very, very briefly, if I could, about this new, very ambitious project that the Africans have embarked on, the intra-African common market. How realistic is it? And how worried are you that there may, may be eventually some invisible hands that may want to thwart this sort of project? We're already seeing good progress. African countries coming together to create this African uh, free trade area uh, that has come into being. We are going to see trading happen by July next year. Uh, a number of countries we have seen out of 54 countries, 55, we have already gone beyond up 30 and beyond who have ratified and uh, it's, it's going to happen because people understand the benefits, we've seen the benefits, and I think it's, it's, it's going to happen. My last question, uh, President Kagame, and I suppose it's never too early to ask, but will you be seeking a fourth term in office? I don't know yet, but most likely, no. Most likely not, no. but not a definitive not. No, it's, when I say most likely, it is. I don't know, I always want to not lock myself into anything. I want to have some breathing space, but I think given the way things are or have been in the past and my, it depends on two things, but I think I've made uh, my mind on where I'm concerned personally that uh, it's not going to happen the next time.
All right, and so my very, very last question, will you sit down with me again and allow me to ask this question again? Yes, any, any time uh, <laughs> I'm happy to answer any question. So when you are available, let's have another discussion. All right, that sounds good. Everyone is my witness. Thank you very much indeed, President Paul Kagame. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And so while he still has four years to go in his current seven-year term, and despite the stability and remarkable economic progress that he's brought to Rwanda, Paul Kagame seems to be following in the footsteps of some of the other charismatic statesmen who have persisted in power. So will he seek another fourth term in office? For the first time, President Kagame says that where he is personally concerned, it is not going to happen next time. It remains to be seen whether he will follow through on this pledge or whether the lure of perpetual power will have the last say. From me, Rida Fakhri, and all the team here in Washington, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.